So today we're going to do examples of WebSockets. Over the, the past week, we saw WebSocket, uh, the WebSocket Handshake, WebSocket Frames. And then on Friday, we saw WebSocket Handshake and Frames examples where I went into, you know, just, uh, I guess, just Notepad, <laughs> Notepad, and went through manual examples of doing the handshake and parsing the uh, the messages, parsing the WebSocket frames, and then sending frames. Uh, I guess I didn't go through the whole example of sending a frame, but it's the whole same process, but in reverse. And if somebody wants to see that, we might have time today. Um, today, what I want to do is talk about concurrency. This is the big, tricky thing. <laughs> I don't have a better way to word that. But the big thing that's going to potentially trip up a lot of students, I feel, at least last year it did, I feel that we're a lot more prepared right now than we were last year um, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, language choice, the examples I've shown earlier in the semester, the TCP examples were, uh, were set up to make concurrency easier. Uh, and I'm going to have today's lecture where I go through examples I didn't do this last, last year, which really trips students up because they just had to figure it out. I said, uh, when we learn about WebSockets, I said, be cautious about concurrency, and that's it. That's uh, that's all I did. Um, and part of the, the reason there was more of a variety of languages being chosen, there were like, I want to say five languages that had at least three students using them. I, I want to say I might be making that up. But... Um, but this semester, it's mostly Python, a little bit of Node, and then a sprinkling of a few other languages, C Sharp, Java, and uh, and Go. So uh, so we can do this. Actually, I just ran through them. Um, like I said, I was going to for homework three. I forgot to tally up the final results. Two C Sharp, one Go, two Java, a good handful of Node. 12 node, and then the rest Python, which is 90 Python. <laughs> so it's mostly Python and node. Um, and uh, two Java, two C Sharp, and two Go. So I'm going to do a node and Python example. And those of you doing Python, I'm going to make you wait. I'm going to do node first. Um, and then we'll spend the rest of the time looking at Python or taking questions and uh, talking about those questions. For those of you in C Sharp, Go, Java, I think Go handles this really well. Handles Go was built from the ground up with concurrency in mind. And if you're using Go, I, I'm assuming that you're aware of that. Uh, you're aware of that fact. And uh, uh, you wouldn't need an example. C Sharp, I have my, my same stories before. If you're using C Sharp, uh, I see J.M. Lacey in there. Uh, the reason why you chose C-sharp is probably because you have outside experience with it, and I'm going to assume you can handle the concurrency. Java, if you, the two of you who are using Java, if you want to see examples, um, maybe come to office hours with your questions or, uh, or let me know, because uh, honestly, I don't want to do a Java example, especially if neither of you are in chat. That's just a waste of everybody's time. So, but if you're around and you're interested, and you're especially if you're getting tripped up on the concurrency part, let me know. Hit me up. Uh, odds are that you can go through JavaScript and Python. Actually, have two different approaches for concurrency. So, through each of those, you're going to have the concept of your answer in there. So, you should be able to take that and uh, and apply it to Java. I think Java has a little bit of just Java being Java has a little bit of more minutia in there. I think it gets a bit more messy than either JavaScript or Python, uh, in my opinion. But if you're comfortable with Java, you know, it might not be a big deal for you. Uh, but if the only Java experience you have is 115, 116, if you took the old 115, 116, that might get tricky because you've never seen anything quite like that. But anyway, let's get into this and let's talk about how to handle concurrency in each of these languages. Yeah, oh yeah, pre yeah, and I'm surprised nobody chose Scala this semester. I, I think enough of you took the new 116 that you 
been exposed to Scala. You took the new 250. You've had two semesters of Scala. I'm really just surprised to see zero Scala, but still two Java. Maybe I just had my semesters off, and most of y'all took the old 115, 116. I feel like we've been doing the new ones forever, though. That uh, It's hard to imagine we still have students on the old one. Uh, just because it takes four years to get students through the pipeline. It felt the whole pipeline with Scala. Uh, students who've seen Scala. It, it just it seems like it's been forever, but yeah, maybe it has been three years, and most of y'all are seniors. Okay, anyway, let's do this thing. So this is a very basic node server. So I don't need this at all because I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use this over here, and uh, and I got to get to. Oh, shoot. I have to get to my directory. Did I not run? I didn't run the Python one. No, but this is mounted. Oh, yeah, never mind. I I'm thinking the wrong thing. I'm thinking backwards. All right, so streamer. One second for my brain to wake up. Yeah, it is in there. How did that not? I did the right thing. Oh, because Intel, and I didn't type enough. Uh, I only typed the I. I see. Uh, CC E312. Underscore. Uh, CD servers. CD node server, node server, starting to the server, and the server does pretty much nothing. If it's a get request for the root, we're going to respond with hello, otherwise 404. So let me go to my browser, go to localhost, what port are we listening on, 8000, and we get hello, yay, go us. Uh, so we have a working server. What I want to talk about is how to handle the concurrency part of this. So when we have an HTTP server like we've had up until this point in the semester, we didn't have to worry about this yet. With WebSockets, we will. So with an HTTP server, what we're doing is receiving an HTTP request. We get that request read it from our TCP socket, handle that request, send a response, and then after we send that response, we don't need that TCP connection anymore. It can be closed. The next message could be over that same socket. We, we just don't care at all because HTTP is a stateless protocol. We're going to handle requests completely with complete disregard for any sense of state we're just going to handle every single request in complete isolation so it doesn't matter if this is the same user sending two requests over the same tcp socket different tcp sockets different ip addresses uh, we just don't care none of that matters to http if we do want to simulate some sort of state we're going to use cookies, which is a topic we'll talk about next week, but I'm sure you're all familiar with at least the concept of cookies, and we'll see how we can get those done with HTTP. Uh, the, the short answer to that is uh, we use HTTP headers, and there are headers that are going to tell us to set cookies, and we're going to set headers that say, hey, browser, set this cookie, and then send the cookies back and forth in headers. Uh, so if you don't have great header parsing code, I'd recommend you write that really soon before we start doing cookies. So the way JavaScript handles it in this net library is every time data is received from any TCP socket, it's going to call whatever callback function you give it here. So on the data event, call this function with the data that was received. Now for buffering, you would read, uh, you would take this data, read the headers, read the content length, and then have some way of storing the content length. And with Java, you know, I, I, this is too close to a global variable for my taste, but this is the way JavaScript, uh, you know, 
to the way to get it done, I guess. Uh, in in uh, jeez, even saying that, I don't like that. I should have found a better way to to do this outside of uh, uh, inside of the class. If I put it right here, it won't persist. Um, right? I, actually, I, yeah, I tested that. It must not have, but uh. Uh, yeah, it, it, I did test it. It didn't persist. I think you can create the server and then add the callback and get it at the get that variable at the server level, if you want to do it that way. Uh, I, I hate I I thought I'd be okay with this, but I got to this point and I'm like, man, I'm showing my class a global variable, ain't I? That is a global variable, isn't it? Ugh. All right. Well, I guess module level, but um, I think. Yeah, module level. So it's not quite global. It's module level, but I still don't like it. Anyway, um, so we have this variable that's going to persist across calls of this method. So when you buffered, you probably did something similar. You had a buffer up here that it's going to store the information of the body that's uh, been used. You know what? Yeah, because we don't even have an export at the bottom of the script. That's not global. That's uh, that's module level. Uh, I'm, I'm more comfortable with that. So you have your buffer up here, and every time you read data, if you're buffering, you would add to that uh, add to that buffer. And then once you read the content length number of bytes, then you're going to handle that request. So that's what you've done in homework three. Uh, and hopefully you got all the buffering, uh, all that buffering side done and did what you needed to do, to do there. But uh, whatever you did, it was probably similar to what I just said. You might have the setup just a little bit different, but regardless, over multiple calls of this function, you have to collect all of the data that's been sent in your buffer, and then once you read content length, that's when you're handling the request. You have something to that effect in your code, something that does that, um, has that functionality. That works fine when you have one client at a time, one simultaneous client what if you had two users who are both uploading large files at the same time how do you handle that when every time you receive data remember this is called for any client this function is called for any client whenever there's data to be read off their tcp socket so how do you distinguish between multiple clients who are sending you information and what happens when those clients are connected simultaneously. So with files, that's a situation that would certainly happen in reality, like that's going to happen. For our testing, for our homework three, we didn't worry about that so much. We didn't worry about uh, concurrent file uploads. With WebSockets, we have to be concerned with this. If we want to use WebSockets for any of its intended purpose, we have to solve this. Uh, we have to start thinking about this. So when we receive data, uh, oh, sorry, why I should explain why, just a, a refresher. So when you create a, a WebSocket connection, you're actually leaving that TCP socket open. It's not like HTTP where you could be done with that TCP connection. You know, it could be reused. It might not be reused. It's whatever. With WebSockets, you're leaving, you, that HTTP request comes in. It's an upgrade request to WebSockets. You go through the handshake and now you and the browser, your server and the browser, both leave that TCP connection open. So first of all, <clears throat> if you don't handle have any concurrency, when a second user, you open up another a second tab and you try to connect with a WebSocket connection, if your server it has no concurrency, zero concurrency whatsoever, while your server is sitting somewhere in a, a uh, an infinite loop waiting for data in the other TCP connection, guess what it's not doing is listening for new connections, for new users and new clients to connect to it. So once you have a connection that's open, you have to wait for information to come over over this TCP socket connection that's used as a web socket connection while simultaneously listening for new connections, which also might be web socket connections. So if you have five users on your site, you have five TCP socket connections open that are marked as web socket connections and you have to be listening to every single every one of those connections listening for data 
and also sending data over those connections while simultaneously or concurrently listening for new connections. So your code has to be doing multiple things at the same time. It no longer suffices to just call this function whenever data is received, handle that, and then go back to the function because you would want somewhere in here an infinite loop that says keep listening for data over this connection. Now JavaScript doesn't handle it quite like that, the, the way that I just said, the last sentence that I said just there. Um, but we do have a way to, to handle this. So remember, this is called every time there's data to be read from any socket connection. So what we want to do is keep track of the WebSocket connections that are WebSocket connections, the connections, the TCP connections that have been upgraded to WebSockets. We want to keep track of those and then have an if statement somewhere near the top of your code before you start parsing headers Near the top of your code, you want to say, if this is a WebSocket connection, handle it as a WebSocket frame. Handle data as a WebSocket frame. Get our bit manipulation out. Start looking for the exact data that I expect following the WebSocket frame protocol. And then send, a, you know, do whatever you have to do. Either send a response or broadcast a message to all WebSocket connections. But th there is... The fact that you have to remember all of the WebSocket connections that are open. So you have to remember if this is a WebSocket connection. So, uh, so a few things we need to do. One, remember that this socket is a WebSocket connection. There are a few ways to do this. Right here, I'm reading the remote address and the remote port, which is going to give me this string right here going to tell me who is connecting based on their IP and port number, which is going to be unique for each user. I'm going to read that. I'm going to call that the client ID that's going to identify this particular client. And then I'm going to add that to my client list. Here, mind you, I'm not giving you the whole homework solution. There's more that you have to do on top of this. But I'm going to add that to a list of clients. And now I can say, I've received a message from this client. And then I'm just going to print out the, the list of clients afterwards. So if I go to this site again, uh, so we, first of all, we can see that the first two connections, I went to this site twice. Or sorry, I went to this site once, but I got a, uh, an icon request. If I, And both of those were sent over the same TCP connection. So that connection was not closed, and it was reused for another connection. If I refresh this, that connection should have timed out by now, and I'll get a new port. I'll get a new TCP connection from the same client. With WebSockets, you're going to take one of these, whatever one, whatever the whatever port was used to make the request for your uh, for your uh, WebSocket connection, the upgraded one. That one. So it's, let's say it was this one. You're going to have to say, okay, this TCP connection, this is a WebSocket connection. Let's keep listening for information on this for WebSockets. And you would say in JavaScript, if remote address colon remote port equal uh, is contained in this list of clients, then this is a WebSocket connection. Parse it as a WebSocket frame. Else, do your all your HTTP stuff. Parse this as an HTTP request. So you have two di different types of requests that could be coming over a TCP socket connection. You'll also need uh, you also need references to the socket itself. So this socket is going to be a reference to the socket for that connection. So you also need to store this socket as well. So something like client socket. I want that to be plural. Client sockets that push the socket. We still have to remember the socket for that user too. So when we want to broadcast a message, we can go through all of our client sockets, iterate through those, and write information to every single one of them. Write our WebSocket frames. If we're writing a chat app, like for the homework, getting a message in, and then going through all of our WebSocket connections and writing data to each one of those connections to make sure that everybody gets that WebSocket frame. So you have to remember 
which remember the connections that are web sockets and remember the sockets store those sockets as well so we have some data structure work to be able to get all of our connected clients remember to remember all of our WebSocket connections so we can interact with our clients because what's the point of a WebSocket connection if we never store a reference to the socket and can never write to that TCP socket asynchronously then what's the point of using WebSockets we kind of defeated the purpose uh, one big part of the purpose so we keep a reference to that socket so then later on we can send that information uh, we can send that information back. If we do this a few more times, we can see, you know, all the... Oh, that one didn't time out. With, uh, I know it's just in testing, the node server, the net, um, the net library, the net module, uh, does tend to reuse the same connection a lot, which is, I don't know, I found that weird, but, um, but we'll see in a minute, the Python library doesn't. So the Python socket server will close the connections, but the net framework won't, so... For what it's worth. JLabel, what's up? What's going on? All right. Everyone happy with Node? Everyone who's using Node got a good idea of what they're doing there? And of course, at this point in the semester, I'm giving away way less solutions in my examples. With the early HTTP stuff when I was doing examples, it was really difficult to not give away the whole you know, most of the assignments because just because we weren't doing that much. Um, but these days, what we're doing is tricky enough, complex enough, I should say, uh, that I can talk about the theory and the concepts and leave it up to you to put them all together to, to form a working server, working WebSocket server. Python. Let's talk about Python. This is what I came here for. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> Panic over. As I was thinking, as I was typing that, I'm like, you know what? I never tested this. I never made sure that Python 3 is going to run. And then I see that error. Oh. But it's just port already in use because I'm reusing 8000 and JavaScript hasn't given it up yet. Oh my goodness. What's up, no surfboard? Uh, I'm just going to wait for... Oh, I don't have to restart anything. It's just a timeout thing. It's because I uh, I killed the JavaScript program. I'm going to take this time to take a sip of tea. Alright. You know what? I'm not going to make you all wait. Let's just change the port. So the functionality here, same thing as before, just says hello, except we don't have our 404. We have a little less uh, functionality overall. I don't have uh, this split into different functions or anything, but same idea, we're just, uh, just a hello world example. So I can talk about concurrency. So with, with Python, Things are a little bit different. The setup for Python is uh, is quite a bit different here. So let's talk about it. Same concept, same theory, same goal, different approach, just because Python handles this a little bit differently. So Python is going to have this handler, the base request handler, Any anyone using Python has seen this, I don't have to explain it. But this handle, func handle method is called whenever you have a TCP connection. The scope of this is at the TCP connection level, not at reading data off a particular connection. So in JavaScript, your method that's handling the data was called every time there's information to be read from any socket, and that function is called, you know, that function, that callback function handles every WebSocket connection. This is a little bit different in that handle is going to handle each connection. So handle is called when you get a TCP connection. And then you do everything you need to do with that TCP connection. Let me get rid of this stuff first. 
I'll, I'll talk about that, but let's not let's not start you off with a well true. Um, and then we're going to handle that connection. And then once you get to the bottom of this method, once this method call ends and that stack frame is over, that connection is going to end. That connection is going to close. So let me get rid of that. Yeah, I, I thought that was going to happen. Uh, all right, we're just going to keep changing the port. <laughs> So I get a request and, oh, let me explain the, the code first. So I'm doing the same thing that I was doing in Python. I'm getting the IP address and the port number for this connection. I'm concatenating them together to get a unique ID for this particular TCP connection. Uh, and then printing it out, adding it to a data structure here, since I have a class in objects of this type, I can store this, uh, I vastly misspoke there. I have a class. Uh, I can add this to the scope of the class instead of adding it as a global variable. I believe this would actually be a global variable in Python. I don't know. I, I haven't didn't really think about that before this lecture. Uh, this is a class variable in Python. If you haven't seen these before, this is not a an instance variable. This is not attached to the objects of this type. This is attached to the class. It's similar to having a static variable in Java or a variable inside an object in Scala. I know everybody's seen at least one of those two things. So um, uh, so hopefully one of those examples hit you. But this is a class variable. The scope is of the class, not the object. So this variable is shared across every object of type my TCP handler. So I have a class variable, uh, effectively a static variable in my code. And I'm going to add my clients to that. And then I can print out all the connections that I have, all those uh, WebSocket connections. And just like the other one, we should have a reference to self.request. So we can call the send all method. Uh, like client, like we did before, client sockets. Client sockets. Oops. So we can store references to the sockets themselves as well. So we can, one, identify a connection as a WebSocket connection, and two, send information over the WebSocket connections after, you know, outside of this handle method. And this one we actually don't need in Python. We can still do that. It can still be helpful, but it's not necessary for the way Python has this, uh, does this setup. So whenever we hit the end of the handle method call, Python's going to close that connection. So you can see now getting back to what I was saying over here. So I made a request for the root path. The browser came along and said, hey, you're going to need an icon for that as well. Well, that was sent over two separate TCP connections because once I handled this request, got to the end of handle, Python closed that connection. And then this had to be a new connection to make the next request. If I keep requesting things, I'm going to keep getting new connections. It's possible that some of these IP, some of these ports are going to be repeated. They'll be reused eventually. Looks like that was not the case here. It wasn't the case here, but you can kind of see how your browser picks out IP addresses. Quick side note, your um, how your browser knows when you get a response, how it knows which request that belongs to. Well, it's opening a new TCP port for each connection and then it's knowing well if i receive a response if i receive data on this port then that's for uh that's for the icon if it, i receive a response on this port that's for the html uh and that's how 
web traffic is routed through your machine. So for example, you have multiple browsers, multiple tabs, all open at the same time. Well, they all just have different ports that they have open. So your OS knows which browser, if I have Chrome and Opera open at the same time, my OS knows by the port numbers which where to route internet traffic, what tab to route that to, and then the browser knows, based on the port number again, which particular HTTP request that belongs to. So that's how everything's routed uh, beforehand. Uh, common misconception, one that I certainly made, is that all web traffic is over port 80. That's only true, uh, 80 or 443. That's only true for servers, and even then it doesn't, it's not necessarily true, but it's the standard. Uh, for the clients, the port numbers are usually these very high port numbers that are just whatever port number we have. Just something so we can identify this is for this tab of this browser for this request. Anyway, we got a whole bunch of very high port numbers. They're all different because the connection was closed each time we made this connection. Now, what if we don't want to close the connection? Once a connection is made, if we don't want to close that connection, we have to avoid reaching the end of the method. How do we avoid reaching the end of a method? Why an infinite loop, of course. Hit it with the well true or the old forever loop. Something you, you usually want to avoid writing an infinite loop. Here we're intentionally writing an infinite loop. And this receive method is a, is a pretty smart method, really. What this method does, and you haven't had a reason to care about this yet until WebSockets, but this method call is going to do a few different things based on the situation that we're currently in. So this method, if there's data to be read off the TCP socket, it's going to read that data and give it to you. That's the one you're used to. That happens all the time. If there's no data to be read, this method call is going to hang. And your code is just going to sit here. It's just going to sit here on this method call and wait until there's data to be read. So if I say well true, the first thing that's called is this method. This dot strip confused so many people last time. That doesn't need to be there. It shouldn't be there. This, uh, I found out where it's in the documentation where I pulled that from, has a dot strip in there, and w which I you'd normally like, but for a lot of our purposes, that causes errors, like image uploads, that causes an error. The So <clears throat> we want to receive data, and it's going to sit here and wait until there's data to be received, until there's data to be read on the TCP connection. So once the client sends us a request, then this method returns, we run all our parsing code, we handle the request. And then with this, well, with this forever loop, we handle that request and then go right back up to the top and wait on that TCP connection to send us more information. So you should already see that this is going to be necessary for WebSockets. You have to reuse a WebSocket and keep receiving information over the same WebSocket. You're gonna need this well true. It's gonna be scary to type, but that's what you need here. You don't have to worry about this really breaking things because you're just gonna hang here. It's not actually just gonna run in circles in this method forever. This receive method, can I, I don't think I can go to sources here. Uh, this receive method is gonna sit there and wait, which probably has its own well true loop and, uh, and wait for information to be said. The other thing that this does is if the connection has been closed, this is going to throw an exception. And that's why I have this try accept uh, you can do some exception handling, or you can just print a message. You know, you can make sure you got the right error, the connection closed, and then print uh, connection closed uh, by client. You can print out some error here. So this is how we can keep the connection open forever. So, got a hair in my mouth, gross. Um, so let's end this if I can hit the right buttons let's change the port again we can go back to 8000 
because 8,000 is freed up now. And now when I send requests, I can see that the port is being reused. I have a single TCP connection and the browser saying, hey, if you ain't closing that, I ain't closing that. And we get to keep reusing that same port number. Now when I go to another tab, I'll get, did I not get a different port number? That would be surprising. Uh, that is surprising. Not, not outrageously so, but uh, that is pretty surprising. So let's open another browser, uh, localhost 8000, and now we'll certainly get a new port because uh, Opera and Chrome are not going to communicate with each other. But it looks like Opera has some optimization under the hood where it says if you have two separate tabs, they can re they can share TCP connections. Not sure if I even like that. I feel like there's some security issues there. Um, but it is what it is. We'll, we'll accept that. Uh, but a different browser, they're not going to share information across each other. So we will get new a new TCP connection for the separate browser. Uh, I want to say Google doesn't do that. Does Google have a new process for each tab? No. Hey, I'm learning too. Uh, that's pretty neat. Okay, so what we have, if you set your, your server up like this, this, is the last thing I, I really need to emphasize. If you set your server up like this, that all just worked, right? If you have your server set up like this, that threading is a very important word we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about it in uh, a second here. But this, if you have this set up, you're going to have a bad time. This is going to be a tough one. If you have TCP server. Because at some point, you're going to have this well true loop. Oh, by the way, JavaScript is built from the ground up with concurrency in mind. So we didn't really have to think about concurrency there. But in Python, once we have the well true loop, how do I also listen for another connection? Now we saw right there that we are doing that, but you're going to have this well true. If this is a WebSocket request, send the upgrade response in HTTP and then enter a well true loop and then listen for data, treat those as WebSocket frames and do all your WebSocket frame parsing until you need another, uh, until you receive the re a request again, there's more, another message to be received on the WebSocket connection and just keep doing that forever. Uh, for our purposes, that's fine. Uh, the client, you know, that connection is eventually going to get severed. You can listen for the client to send you a request to close the connection and handle that. We're not going to get into every little detail of WebSockets. Maybe someday I'll make the class do that. Uh, but now we're just going to wrap it in this try accept. Once the client closes the connection, this is going to throw an exception and then we'll exit and say the client closed the connection and should have more, you know, we should have better error handling here, but you know, it is what it is. So this is what you'll have to do in your WebSocket connection. But once you're in this well true loop and most of the time you're just hanging out on this method call, how are you listening for more connections? So let's restart this server yet again. Let's go back to 8001. I make a request, and now I'm wondering now. This sh I would expect this to hang, but since it's reusing the port, I don't know. It's really interesting to me. It's something I didn't know that it was going to reuse the port across tabs. And I swear I did the same demo after out after lecture earlier in the semester, and it did that. But what do we expect once I hit enter here? What do we expect to happen? Nothing. We're going to get loading forever. So my entire server right now is in this well true loop and waiting right here with this socket connection. So this socket connection can send requests for days. It's, it's waiting right here. Whenever I hit refresh, this gets a request, parses it, responds with hello, and then goes right back here and starts listening again. But that's the only thing my server does 
It's the only thing my server is doing right now. So when a second user, which is a feature we probably want, is at least two users using our websites. When a second user tries to connect, the server isn't listening for new connections because it's stuck in that in that infinite loop, listening for data over this connection. So we can't have a second connection. So this is what happens when you have a lack of concurrency in your server and you have these persistent TCP connections that have been upgraded to WebSocket connections. This is the error you're going to see if you don't have concurrency figured out. You're going to be great in one browser. You can send WebSocket frames. You can receive WebSocket frames. Everything's awesome. You open a second, apparently a second browser that's going to really trip me up because in my testing notes, I say tab. Um, actually, it, it should it should be fine with the whole WebSocket stuff because the second tab is going to send a upgrade an upgrade request and you're going to parse it as a frame. So, uh, you know, will that will that cause issues? Goodness, I hope not. I wonder if that's a new thing for browsers because this didn't come up last uh, last year. Anyway, or I just or I, somehow I just missed it by all chance. Anyway, the whole server's on this connection waiting for more data. This one doesn't have a chance. Until, until this connection buggers off. That should have. Browser's keeping that connection open. I'm not waiting for no I'm not waiting for a timeout here. But eventually the browser would be like, okay, I'm done with that connection. And then this page will load. It's not exactly optimized. But once I add threading here, it's a very important word. Once I add threading here, now the the TCP server, my socket server, is going to create a new thread for each connection. With a new thread for each connection, whoa. There must be all the, the Chrome requests that couldn't get through earlier. But now that I'm creating a new thread for each connection, this gets its own thread in that well true loop. This gets its own thread in the well true loop. And we have glorious concurrency. We have concurrent users until we run out of resources, which threads are pretty heavy, so it will happen. Um, you know, it won't take too long to, to use up those resources. But we can have concurrent users. Will the threading mix in handle a multi part request? I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, video games are just big old well true loops. That's all a video game is. Uh, I shouldn't say all a video game is, but uh, video games start with a big well true that executes. Uh, usually a couple actually that at least one that executes at your frame rate that executes once per frame and then usually another loop that handles the more heavy load stuff uh, like uh, AI computations physics comp calculations yeah, usually just a couple of well true loops it runs until you exit the game really all software like this browser right here, somewhere in there, there's a, a well true, a loop that's running forever. Because if the program ended, you know, we wouldn't get to use it. <clears throat> the threading hand it makes in handle a multi-part request. I mean, it will. I mean, you can use threading with the multi-part request. It's not going to break your multi-part code, but it's not going to. I don't know. It wouldn't parse it for you. I don't think that's what you're saying though.